The secret to selling though is going to the past. When you say, tell me your story, that's a past question. On average, 3% of the questions that we ask were in the past. Why do salespeople not ask past questions? Because they think it's dead, done, closed. And you can't sell into the past. Oh no, everything you want to sell into the future is where? The past. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of so many examples that I've activated this theory in. Um, you know, I, I made a proposal for a company uh, where I said, I'm just going to follow his process. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put double the price and see what happens. So, Good. but I said I'm gonna follow the process to see what happens. They said a yes. Understand, quantify, and be able to sell a specific solution that would demonstrate return on investment to meet the needs, short term, long term. Even though they were perceived as maybe the highest cost, they were actually the lowest total cost solution. And of course, they won the opportunity. Hi guys, uh, this is your friend Ashish Janiani on the channel, which is also named the same thing. And uh, it's my pleasure that you joined me on the channel to go through some of the content that we've got for you from some of the greatest, most creative, knowledgeable experts on the subject of sales, uh, primarily speaking. And I've got one such man today who's had a very important personal impact in my life. I came across this man while I was working out. Uh, his book came to me as a suggestion. Uh, so I listened to books when I work out. It was called Questions That Sell. I liked the title and I just started playing the book to see how it was. What happened was that I listened to the book once, then I listened to the book twice. Then I got the book, I went through the book, and I summarized the entire book. Now, I don't do that with all books, right? But I did it with this book. I integrated his information into my training programs, and it just went on so beautifully. It got into my subconscious, and today I use his material on an emotional level, and it makes logical sense also. If you are a B2B high-value seller, consultant, uh, this information and this interview with Paul Cherry is for you. He's written other books, Questions That Get Results, The Ultimate Sales Pro, Questions That Sell is what we will be primarily speaking about today. Please help me welcome Paul Cherry on Ashish Janiani. Good morning. How are you? Hi, Paul. Paul. Oh, Paul, good morning. Good evening good from morning. India. How are you doing? Oh, thank you so much. And do I pronounce it Ashish by chance? Yes, or no? that's perfect. That's absolutely Ashish. perfect. Yes, thank there you. we go. Thank you. There we go. Thank Paul, you. I want to start with this. Uh, I just want to genuinely tell you, I've literally poured into your content questions right. that sell, adapted right. it, and it means a lot. It means a lot. That, oh. that knowledge is outstanding. Wow. I'm very humbled. Humbled and honored, Ashish. Right. You are that 2% of individuals, maybe it's 1% to actually, you know, be able to dive in, embrace and assimilate it. And, you know, it's Ashish, there's so much knowledge out there today, and yet people are more ignorant than ever. So you've there written you books. Uh, I want to start with, you know, who Paul Cherry is, how did you get into sales and what made you write the books? And then we can pick up my favorite book because that's the only book I've read questions that sell from you and interact on that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Good. Okay. Ashish, yes. And thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to be here today and uh, to share with you just a some insight in terms of how I got into sales. Dad was a salesperson all his life. And after I got my master's degree, I figured, you know what, six months uh, working in government, I was like, I'm going to do what dad did. And that is sell. So <laughs> got into sales and, and just it's, to this day, I live and I breathe selling. Uh, but I also love to educate. And I wanted to be a teacher, but teachers don't make any money. So how can I be the best of both worlds combined education and sales, which is why I got into corporate training and development. But I came across a book um, with Neil Rackham back in 89, and he really is the guru of, of questioning. And in his book, and as you described about dog earing, writing things down and circling and going through the book, <laughs> I did, that was the book that I did, um, that I reviewed his book. And it really inspired me, but where Neil Rackham, I, I believe fell short was, how do you actually construct 
construct and develop a question, just like a songwriter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have you have people who sing, but the, who, the people behind who actually create the song, it isn't one note. It's a combination yes. of strings of notes. And that's what questions is. So, but it instilled me after Neil Rackham and when it, 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 it changed my life because I slowed down the sales process, took time to really ask those thought provoking questions and to listen. And mm. it, it forced me to realize that, okay, it's time for me to write my own book. And that's when I came out with the questions that sell and, oh, I guess it came out in 03. And, and, and then we had the second edition uh, coming out in uh, two years ago. And it's now in five languages. It's been a bestseller. It's number 38 by bookauthority.org. Wow. The number 38 best sales book of all time. So I'm very honored and humbled by that. And, but you know what? I'm a learner. And uh, as soon as I think I know everything, I realize how much I don't. But the bottom line is this, I'll keep it real simple. And that is uh, in working with 1200 organizations to date from entrepreneurs to leading 40 fortune 500 companies, there's selling is not complicated. Let me just share three things that people, if people want to be successful in sales, hmm. it's what made a difference for me and others. Number one, number one, here it is. Ask the <laughs> right questions. It's so simple. People want to talk. They want to be engaged. They want to be listened to. It's their ego. Get them involved. And, and I don't mean questions are like, are you the decision maker? How much money do you have? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and just, you know, what are your needs? How much do you buy? Who are you using? Those are offensive. I'm talking, well, we can give, get into examples of the right questions mm. that pull people in. So that's number one. And I think a lot of salespeople and me, <laughs> we struggle because yes. we like the shortcut, get to the point. We want to be brief and, and, and try to close the deal. And all we do is create objections <laughs> and stalls and no's. Okay. So number one, ask the right questions. Number two, mm. number two is about the right people. Mm. And man, Ashish, <laughs> I just connected with you immediately. You want to know why? Why? You were just, <laughs> you were very gracious to say how you read my book, how much you love the book, what your takeaway, there's connection there. Okay. Yes. And you know, it's, it's all about connecting with people. If you can connect with people, it tells you something you're connecting with their values, their beliefs, their motivations. I learned a lot about you in just 10 minutes. I'm like, you impressed me. Okay. The right yeah, people. Thank you. Wow. And number three is the right finding the right opportunities. Hmm. Right? And all I mean by that is, yeah, I get it why we ask these questions. Are you the decision maker? How much are you buying? Who are you using now? What are you paying? Can I offer you a quote? That's not determining the right opportunity, but the right opportunity is, is, is do they really fit the profile of the ideal customer we want to work with, you know, and I don't mean yes. demographically for me, for example, how many salespeople, you know, what volume is your company, who you're, I mean, that's all basic, but really opportunity is about, are you an organization that really believes in investing and developing your mm -hmm. people is really passionate about your brand, your image, your reputation, you know, that you really want to, are you progressive opportunities yes. See, in terms of my industry? But I wanted your, your listeners today, that's what I mean about, it's the demographics, yeah, where we get caught up in, but I'm talking about the psycho, psychographics. Yes. And I yeah. think that's where I want to begin because the first thing that I noticed about your book, by the way, you know, you, you say it in the book, is uh, the, you know what happens when you ask a question, people respond. So, so, you know, like it was as basic as that. You ask a question and people do respond psychologically. But the first thing that I picked up was there are three kinds of people, organizations you will meet. It is should, want, <laughs> okay. and have. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, I studied that material thrice. So I studied everything thrice, but I paid attention because after I went through it, I was like, <sighs> like, I was like, I can, I now know, uh, you know, this is, this is where I'm going wrong. I'm just prospecting for the sake of it without yes. realizing, is this should, is this want, is this have, can you throw some light on that? Because that's the third point, you know, the opportunity, and then we'll come to the question bit of it and go deeper. Yeah. 
And realize when I talk about, you know, this, the discovery, mm-hmm. um, it's a, what I call a core competency of outstanding salespeople. And in the discovery, we all realize that there is a step before that. And that is earning some trust, some credibility. You know, there's that 30 seconds, sometimes it's two, three, five minutes. It depends on the culture. Mm-hmm. Just because you ask a great question, and we can talk about examples of questions in a moment. But just for the, the purpose, thought-provoking, power-probing questions that really stimulate the thought process, stretch the person's comfort zone, get them to think and think differently, questions that your competition is not asking, it doesn't mean people are going to answer, but you do get them to think. Hmm. But it does allow you to validate whether that person has that desire, motivation, and interest. And, and I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I got a call from a COO, chief operating officer of a manufacturing firm. He said, Paul, we heard some nice things about some work you did with the sister division. We'd um, like to, we're going to be bringing our people together on October 12th and interested if you could be available to work with our people. So I started asking some questions because I thought, okay, well, I, I happen to be available and I asked him, okay, well, how many people are we talking about? What do you want me to talk about? Um, where's it located, what kind of budget he looked to want to stay in. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I was getting one word, two word answers. What mm. was I just guilty of? I was guilty of not engaging this person. I was, I call it quote unquote fishing. These were selfish, self-serving questions, my needs, not theirs. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I wrote this book, Questions That Sell, why aren't I using it? <laughs> so here we're asking, I'm asking questions thinking, am I, am I pulling the person in? No, I'm pushing them away. And so, to answer your question, I was thinking, is this person in the should stage, want to, or have to stage? Should stage is defined as somebody who has no desire, or interest, or motivation because mm. they don't they don't give you thought provoking answers, they don't give you depth or breadth, and they're 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 happy and content with status quo. Whereas somebody in the want to stage is they're motivated, receptive, and open. Uh, but there's hesitancy, doubt, or fear, concern. That's just human nature, you know? Nobody wants to jump in until there's a process. For many of us uh, listeners, you probably sell a complex sale, right? Which is Mm. multiple conversations. Maybe it's intangible, significant investment. It's going to have an impact long-term. You want a relationship? Most people are going to be sort of wallowing in that want-to stage. Very few are in the have-to stage where it's like, oh, I'm so glad you called, Ashish. Wow, I've been (laughs) waiting for your call. Here it is. Let's go. That doesn't happen. But they are few and far between. But our job as a sales professional is to recognize, here it is. Here's the when I said opportunities. Recognize who's in a want-to stage. Should stage, push them out. Want-to, receptivity, openness, let's continue to dive to help you move to the have to stage. So getting back to my example, Hmm. so I'm not jumping all over the place, back to this example, I said, okay, let's stop for a moment because I was asking myself, wait a minute, is this person in the should or want to stage? They Hmm. reached out to me with interest, so I'm gonna assume they're in the want to stage. So I said, let's step back for a moment. Let's understand the bigger picture, what you're trying to accomplish. So here comes the power probing question. So tell me a little bit about where you see you and your organization three to five years from now. That's it. They're they're not complicated questions, but it was Mm. a big picture vision, um, long-term perspective. And it was about not just this individual, but the organization, the, the people, the team, the customers even, his marketplace. That was Mm. really what's embedded in there. Now, here's what happened because the individual had to stop and pause for a few seconds and say, well, hmm, that's a very good question. And you know what? He started talking about growth strategies, challenges, competitive threats, expanding overseas, really, really getting in some substance and some depth. Mm. He was talking for a good maybe three minutes. And then I came back after that and I said, well, good. Tell me a little bit about what you've done in the past before and what have been the challenges you faced. And that's where he said, well, we've been going through a lot of changes, cultural changes, 
uh, a new CEO who's brought in a big, big perspective of our entrepreneurial mindset, trying to develop structures, accountability. It's been really disruptive. Um, and as a result, is coming from, and it's really it's this big turnover. And because of the turnover, we're losing good quality people. And our big concern is if we're really going to hit our marks moving forward. So my last question was, well, help me understand the impact on you and, and the business moving forward if you don't achieve the goals you just shared with me long-term. And that's when he said, well, if that continues, our big concern is, is that we'll probably get bought up, be acquired. And in my particular situation, most likely I'll be without a job. Wow. That got personal. Mm. That got wow. personal. Yes. I will be without a job. See the motivation there? See where I got him from the want to stage, just talking about problems, challenges, frustrations to the have to stage where I got to do something because if I don't, I, 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 that pronoun. Does that help? I kind of threw a yes. lot out oh, there. Oh, yeah, but- yeah. No, no, no. It, it, it's all in structure. It does. And, 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 you know, I was just thinking about the concept that you have in the book. There are different triggers, internal, external customers, and that's what oh, yeah. you're hitting on right now. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I'm going to recommend your listeners really you know, think about that when you're talking to your customer, that, that silly question about, um, and I shouldn't say silly, I understand. Here, here's an example. Uh, when I get into, and I, we probably won't have time to de- talk about the design of a question, but here's something, uh, I actually have fun with questioning. Here's an example of structuring. The question, are you the decision maker, right? Are you the decision? Now, is that a closed-ended or an open-ended question? That's a close-ended Close. question, yeah. right? You're getting a yes or no answer, right? Yes. Now, how about this, Ashish? Is is it an important question? And the answer is- It is well, an important question, yes. But if it's structured better, I think you get a better response, right? That's right. Because it's almost, think about it. Well, are you the decision maker? <laughs> is that a little offensive or belittling, meaning- um, are you important enough that I should be talking to? You know, it's just, it's not a good question. So we talk about how do we salvage those questions where I'm not interrogating people or annoying or making them feel unimportant, but really Mm. creating open-ended questions. And how do you do that? Well, in my book, we talk about the majority of the questions we ask begin with the who's, the what's, the where's, the when's, the why's, right? The five W's. One of the simple things, if you want to get people more engaged, is just tweak that front end of the question with a descriptive opener. Descriptive openers, what are they? Examples are describe for me, tell me, share with me, walk me through, help me understand, take me through. So for example, let's go back, Ashish. Are you the decision maker? How might I salvage that question, make it a thought-provoking question with such as beginning it with describe for me? So let's start that, let's try that together. Describe for me your. Describe for me your decision making process. Oh, you're good. You're good. Oh, that's excellent. See, now what's the difference between are you the decision maker versus (laughs) describe for me your decision making process? See the difference? Yes. Yes. I'm getting three, four questions in that one question now. Finding out who's involved, maybe the priorities, possibly the criteria, the timing, the goals, perhaps just by a little bit of tweak with that. So I recommend your listeners think about when you're dealing with a customer who's not very open, forthright, try some of the descriptive openers. Sometimes I'll, if I, even if I can't think of a question and I'm blank because I'm, you know, anxious, nervous, and we want to think about what we're going to say next, just come out with, well, okay, Ashish, tell me more. (laughs) Go on. It's amazing how people will just like feel obligated to want to talk more if we let them yes and and so important so you know wow like i'm using the process paul you know and and i just want you to know that uh during covid because i use your process it saved me so much time and i closed much better accounts and when i say better accounts like these are better clients that we have because of the process and guys whenever you're listening to this you have to read the book Okay, like, like, for instance, I just want you to know, if you're in sales like me, you know a lot. But when you read Paul's book, you will a realize you don't know a lot. (laughs) So just just to let you know, 
And, and then you have to go through the book to understand how do you fit these questions in your sales process, which yes. is why I read again and again, yes. because I wanted to get yes. the structure right. I was like, okay, yes. he's got me the lock on question, which is what we'll speak about right now. And we're not discussing everything because I wanted to write the book, the decision making question, uh, you know, he speaks about how do you initiate that conversation? Uh, to build that trust in the beginning and how do you find that information and I was like how do I structure all this stuff when I have five minutes when I have a virtual meeting when I have a physical yeah. meeting and yeah. uh, this is what happened to me and, and and you know he's emphasizing just one part of it that that books yes. like a lot of information so if we can go back to the lock-on question that was yes. impactful uh, can you can you talk about that you know with an example Oh, I'm so glad you 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 talk about that. Um, to this day, Ashish, I struggle with which is more important: is it the question, or is it the listening? And, and why I say that is because, you know, my process is to get customers talking 30, 40, 50 percent more than what they normally do, but talking on things that are very pertinent, relevant, meaningful. Okay. So my job is to guide, lead, and direct the conversation versus just people just opening up. But it's being able to, what do you do with all that information? Now, here's some interesting studies. This was done by the Dartnell Research Institute to really understand the percentage of time that customers, customers are not, not telling us what is on their minds. Ashish, do you think that might be high or low? When they're not telling us a lot, it's, it's, it's yes, it's a high. It's high, it's high. And I, Monos, I used the word customers, which means people who are already either buying from you or familiar with you. Imagine if I said prospects, <laughs> way higher. It's because there's a, multiple reasons why people don't tell us. Um, it's because of um, protecting themselves, um, concerns, of vulnerability, being exploited, confiding, lack of trust or lack of confidence. It could be that they do like you. And then the fact mm -hmm. they like you, they don't want to hurt your feelings. Maybe they're shopping around. Maybe it's a negotiating place. A host of reasons. So many reasons why. So we need to recognize that with customers. They have their protected interests. So our, the, why I'm getting into this is the lock-on question is allow me to really understand Okay, the 20% you're telling me, what is it the 80% you're not telling me? And what are your motivations? Because that's the heart of the sale. So, okay, what is a lock on? Oh, and by the way, and that study, before I get a lock on, the, the percentage of time that customers actively listen, you think it's high or low? Oh, it's low. You're right, 20% on average. And especially today, if you have a young person, because of all the distraction with this gadget, right? They're always on it. Yeah. And virtual selling today is even, I'm convinced it's not even 20%. It's probably 10%. So my suggestion to your <laughs> listeners is stop selling. Stop talking. Stop. T they're not listening. Mm. People listen to themselves, though. Oh, they love to hear themselves talk, which means ask good questions. So yeah, we talk about these power probing descriptive questions, which are the big picture questions, goes beyond the present. But then the, the lock on is a tactical question, a lock on, because it's based on a word or a key word that somebody is sharing with me, okay? And it's my job is to listen. Ashish, do you mind, and, and I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but can you just pretend for a moment um, and I'll, you've read the book. Can I pretend that you're in a want to stage? It's irrelevant, yes, what industry yes, or whatever. Let's do that. Let's do Can that. I, I think they'll get value out of it. You're going to give me a response. I don't care whatever comes out of your mouth, but I just want to demonstrate. But you're going to just talk for maybe 20, 30 seconds. And my job is to pick a word or two, whatever it is. Okay. And the there audience, we, we have no preparation on this, right? Yes. Yes, we um, do. Let's do it. So Ashish, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate, you know, your time, what you've shared with me. I'm really honored what you've talked about. Tell me a little bit about what you see are some of the challenges you're facing today and what you foresee are some of the action steps you'll need to take in order to address them. So 
Paul, we've got multiple departments and, you know, we, we've grown pretty fast because of COVID. The, you know, I mean, uh, we've, we've got a structure issue. Uh, we've got young guys, we've got old guys. And uh, it's just that we are in a lot of growth right now. And I think growth comes with its own challenges. And that's what we are trying to solve right now. Mm. This is where, now the key words, there's multiple. There's a, there's a many, I call it a buffet. <laughs> And I don't know if you've ever been to a buffet. You're like, where do I start? It's like a plate. You know how it is. You load it up and then you bring it back to your table and you're like, I don't know where to begin. And of course, I only touch 10% of it. That's the biggest challenge with lock on is because um, it, it, there's so much there. And, and I love that statement because it was, first of all, I, I hit you with a power probing question. Tell me about some of the challenges today and what you foresee are the action steps you'll need to take in order to overcome them. So what happens is what you said was, I listened to some key words and that was um, the word we, 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 we. You said that multiple times and I'm listening to that. So my question is, it's be able to invite and say, you know, you mentioned the word we, tell me about, you know, where the challenge is, where you share the same view on things and where there's disparity. See what I mean? See why yes. I did that? Where there's yes. agreement, where there's disagreement. Why do I want to know that? Because I want to know what, Ashish, I want to know the organization, right? Yes. Do they share in the same perspective? Where do you fit in with that perspective? Is, is this your priority? What's theirs? Where's the conflict? Where's the impediment? Take our time. So the, I, I see how easy it is. Because you mentioned we, we multiple times, but you also said challenges. So and you never define that. So I might, maybe I'll go there. And I'll say, wait, you meant challenges. See the plurality? Yes. My job is to lock them to say, because there's multiple challenges, tell me about one challenge in particular that really rises to the surface and why that is, see? And that's all, it's, it's a tactical vertical question. Listen for a word and then it, it's given a clue to take that word and get depth and breadth, that's all. Yes, and it's like a treasure hunt. And that's what we are saying. Behind these words that a customer uses in the beginning, you need to be attentive and pick up a word, focus on that and, and, and have them go deep into it. Now, personally speaking, right, uh, the word we, the reason I used it is because it's my favorite and you picked it up because it helps me understand the decision making process. Yes, of and course. You mentioned yes. that, right? Am I yes. spending my time with the right person? Because Thank you. I, I may be trying to do everything right. And then I figure out this is not the person. And that's, that's right. what the we question does that, you know, listen, uh, you should, you use the word we, uh, uh, can you walk me through about how does the organization and other decision makers in the process think about yeah. this? And would there be more decision makers that we should be discussing this with, you know, in the coming meetings? You know what? You are spot on. And what I, I found that so many times when I'm dealing with that, I, I hate to use the word low level, um, but I mean, somebody who is, may not have a lot of influence or impact in the organization or a mid-level, but they have an incredible perspective of what's going on. For example, I'll tell you who, who, who somebody who, who can really be your champion. And when I say champion, I define that as somebody who's willing to open up doors for you. So if I can build that trust, that confidence, the fact is, and I'm having this conversation with you, we're developing, cultivating a relationship. Your motivation pretty much is, and I'll, I'd have to validate it is, is it, well, you obviously want to look good. You want to be recognized. You want to feel valued. You want to feel like you're being contributed. I don't know where salespeople get this, but they think that, well, this person, I don't want to step on this person's toes. Well, no. No one's asking you to step on the toes. Leverage this person to out to open open doors with you. I yes. really find if I can develop trust and confidence, in somebody. What's this about? Hey, can I speak to your boss? No, it's about like you just <laughs> said. Let's you, me, and other people in the organization. Let's have a conversation. 
you know i i at about 3 hours ago no 5 hours ago i had a meeting where i followed this process because i read your book so many times or i listened wow. to it, it mm-hmm. it's it's now in my subconscious mind and these guys have um, 350 sales people they are an international brand distributor of products in india and, oh, wow. and uh, i i asked the guy you know exactly this question in the process of uh, so how's the decision making process for your company i'm sure you play an important role in it but if you can walk me through how Go does on. the how do other people play a role in it because i wanted to respect the guy giving me time uh, and if he weren't he would he would let me know but he would feel valued and then he would get me to the truth i have the second meeting with him on monday but with other decision makers and today was our first meeting and that happened because of exactly what we discussed right now oh good for you i i find i love that because uh, i i know i want to know the people involved okay the players and then i want to know criteria that is what each party in that process values so for example somebody who is a purchasing agent we know typically what do they value price right yes yes availability i get that but we also know that they also want to if you dig a little bit deeper you know that as a purchasing agent they don't want to make mistakes you know get a product that is obviously makes them look bad so yes we want to dig there further but also we want to know what else we want to know as you go bigger picture who's involved with that end user so hmm. if you could really um, why am i telling your listeners this is because If you are getting price objections, you really don't understand what people value because price is only one of many reasons why people buy. Am I right? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yes. I've, I'm I'm thinking of so many examples that I've activated this theory in. Um, you know, I I made a proposal for a company uh, where I said I'm just going to follow his process. and i'm just going to i'm just going to put double the price and see what happens because i was in a situ- <laughs> i was in a situation where you know i could i could afford not to close the deal so Good. but i said i'm going to follow the process to see what happens they said a yes because i did the other steps proper i spent time with the decision i spent 3 hours in the first meeting i spent 2 hours in the second meeting so i spent 5 yeah. hours and, and and sometimes i would think oh my god i'm spending so much time what if i don't close the deal am i wasting my time you know all those things yeah. come to your mind but you yeah. know what it all worked out and i'm still doing that project right now as we speak it was a four month project still in the process oh wow wow oh good for you good 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 you know thank you for that maybe i should give an example for the mm. listeners uh, on that lock on when you talk about creating value especially if you're a higher price solution because your example right there wow you were able to double the price and get away with it should i give an example <laughs> yeah please go okay. ahead so um my part of the states where i live um there's a lot of manufacturing snack manufacturing so where the actually snack manufacturing capital of north america and so um potato chips for example there is a firm that um creates potato chips. And so the sales people were coming in with these automated high-end machines that were around a million dollars that would do everything from the you know the cleaning, the processing, the cutting of the potatoes, the heating, cooking to the packaging. Very complex. So um purchasing agents were saying we want uh, multiple quotes. And you know, when you get in that situation mm-hmm. multiple quotes, it's like okay, what's it based on pricing and availability? Well, my client was the highest price solution going in and they figured if we limit if we jump the gun well excuse me jump the gun but if we prematurely come in with a quote most likely we're going to lose yes. so what they said is let's just do our due diligence we really want to understand really what's going on so the equipment that we rec- recommend is going to be exactly what you're looking for not just short term but long term and they said sure so they went in and they were interviewing people from the, on the floor who were actually responsible for actually move you know processing the potatoes and they found out that the machine array the current machine array was breaking down about uh, 24 hours every month so they asked how many bags of potato chips are not being filled you know when it's down 24 hours and they found 5000 bags of chips not being developed that's $2 a bag what is that that's $10000 $10, an hour yeah times 24 oh wow That's, that's all. That's two forty thousand dollars a day. Oh, you're good. Yeah, there you go. A quarter million every month. And they asked, "How many months is this going on?" Oh, at least a year. Oh, 
$2.4 million. And they said, well, downtime, how many people are sitting around doing nothing, uh, not working? And all of a sudden they found out that there's an additional 1 million, 3.4 million. Now they thought, okay, we're ready. Let's start selling. The salesperson said, no, let's find out more. There's more people in the decision-making process getting beyond those people just working the machinery. So they met with the executive team. They said, let's talk about from your perspective, big picture, serving your end user, your marketplace. What they found out that one of their high end customers was ready to cancel a $6 million contract. Why? Because their stores throughout the area were not getting stocked with potato chips. Wow. Now here's what they found out. It was an $8.49 million problem. Here, now, why am I telling you this? Because by finding out that they got a $9 million problem, they came in with a solution that was 48% more than all their competition. Bottom line is because they took the time to understand, quantify, and be able to sell a specific solution that would demonstrate return on investment to meet the needs short-term, long-term, even though they were perceived as maybe the highest cost, they were actually the lowest total cost solution. And of course, they won the opportunity. What an See. example. And, and Paul, That's I think it took on. them a lot of practice, right? It I, is, I, and I, it's lock on. Yeah, yes. you can, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's quantifying the problem. See who you can lock on. Yes. But please continue, Ashish. I, I yeah, no, you. no, no, go ahead. I would just, you know, in my mind processing, it takes practice. And you mentioned that in the book. Don't give yeah. up on the process. It'll come to yeah. you. And I'm sure these guys practice a lot, the, the, the philosophies that we discussed today. But you know what? I, I agree with you. Um, if the listeners and you were awesome to take the time to listen to, to the program, to read the book, I, I don't want people to get so complicated because here's the reality. If you start thinking of the question mm -hmm. and you're really thinking of the construct of the question, are we really listening? And the mm -hmm. answer is, you know, yeah, we're all guilty of that. I think of a question you're talking and all my, I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to ask next? Hmm. When the bottom line is, I don't have to think of the question. You will give me the question to ask if I just listen. listen. If I could suggest any, to keep it so simple, is just be inquisitive. Yeah. Be willing to learn. Put your ego aside so that you want to jump in and try to impress people how great you are and what your products can do. People really, I wish, I wish they cared, but for the most part, they don't. Yeah, and you know, coming towards the summary, a lot of people today, uh, and I want to ask this question to you, is the importance of meeting people, and I'm talking outside COVID, uh, yeah. the importance of meeting people, the importance of a phone call, because a lot of these guys miss the flight. So you see a lot of these kids are born in 2000 when your book came out, but they're just 2021 20, right now. And they're starting their career. So they were born with phones. And then, you know, they got into smartphones. And maybe a decade from now, these guys would have been born with iPhone 6. So we're talking that generation as well. Uh, it's so important, you know, to take them back and talk about while we come to the summary, what is the importance of being a good listener, being a consultant, you know, being genuine, not just getting excited about closing the deal, but about the entire process of completing the project and then making sure that you further it. And in this process, the person that you become, how do you do that? And, uh, you know, what is the importance of this today? Making a phone call to your customer. Yeah. You know, uh, I think, the you know, I, I'm all for the texting, the emails to keep things moving, progressing. But there's incredible value by having that conversations, the annoyances, the intonation, um, the things you don't pick up in a text or, or, or email that would warrant a conversation to really find out the 80, remember the 80% they're not telling you. So when I'm working on an important opportunity, I slow things down and want to have that phone conversation. So I'm not surprised so that, like you said, when you know you're going to present that solution, it isn't, oh, it, it, am I going to get it? No, it's more like I am going to get it because of the quality of the conversation. So we can't do it with everyone, but the right opportunities and the right people, remember, 
that's where we slow it down and want to have those conversations. I want your listeners to, to think that they really need to think of themselves as a sales psychologist. Mm, nice, nice word. It's a mm. sales therapy. Therapy because people do want to talk. It's human nature. They do. If I have the trust and confidence, they want to talk about their issues and needs. When I'm cultivating a relationship, a new relationship, and I'm dealing with an entrepreneur, which many of your listeners are entrepreneurs, yes. here's a great oh, yes. question to connect with an entrepreneur. You know, it, it, it's to say, you know what? Tell me your story. Tell wow. me your story. What a powerful question. Wow. And I think of anybody who's starting their own business or did start their own business, who's in the throes of, 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 of growing their business like you, Ashish, is that the reality is you, I bet you have a very powerful, insightful story. Everybody does. And they want to tell their story because most people don't get that question asked. That's something simple, but I hope I'm to answer your question. We, I, I've seen it all in terms of you know the technology and how much more fast-paced things are and how global global we are today. It seems to be so much more of a smaller world, but the reality is there's some things that don't change, and that is people want connection. Yes, See? there we go. Questions wow, and I listen love to, it. Does it? I yeah. think it's it's such a beautiful way to like kind of you know end the conversation here for new beginnings. Uh, wow, I'm just thinking right now. I'm just in the moment. Uh, tell me your story. I, I'm getting goosebumps because I know <laughs> every entrepreneur is like somebody really wants to know me and what I went through to put this up together. You have to be genuine. You have to be genuine. Oh, I am so glad. You know, thank you. So be inquisitive but you hit on something genuine because I, I will actually have salespeople tell me, Oh, I don't want to ask that question because that person's going to be talking for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, okay, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Especially if they have something meaningful to share with you, why wouldn't you want to do that? But if you're not genuine, if you're not genuinely interested, don't ask the question. Cause I think customers today are very savvy and can pick up if you are manipulative or exploitative and you don't mean it don't go there so yeah. see so you know what i mean simplicity of questions i don't want to complicate it be inquisitive and you spot on be genuine yeah wow paul where do people find you and uh, if you had to give them a road map about going through your book what would that be and uh, what is paul looking forward to in the in the future uh you know the, these are some closing thoughts that i would love for you to please highlight yeah, I I tell the folks is that this and 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 that you can find me at paulcherry.com. One word paulcherry.com. Uh, the book is on Amazon like it's and 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 still in the bookstores today. Uh, if there's anything that I would say is, you know, you'll, to summarize it, it's the quality of the questions. 87% uh, of our questions are in the present. What are you using? What do you like? What don't you like? What are your challenges? What are your problems? What are your needs? Who's your vendor? Get out of the present you put people to sleep, you go more into the future. Future is where there's desires, hopes, and dreams. The secret to selling though is going to the past. When you say, tell me your story, that's a past question. On average, 3% of the questions that we ask are in the past. Why do salespeople not ask past questions? Because they think it's dead, done, closed. And you can't sell into the past. Oh no, everything you wanna sell into the future is where the past, there's power. And I gave you one example of tell me your story. There's other questions you can do as well. So yeah, I would just say, you know what, um, in terms of the book, if you decide you want to get the book, pick one chapter at a time. We got the opening questions, which is educational, which I didn't cover today. I'm just talking about just having meaningful conversations where you went beyond the initial five to 10 minutes. But if you're struggling with that opening on how to make a great first impression to have a dialogue, there's this thing called educational question, study that, very powerful, that really creates an immediate connection and you can bypass the value opening statements, elevator pitches stuff, which is kind of sometimes be careful to be hokey. Okay. <laughs> wow. So my and, take, and, and take away, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just like, where is, what is Paul doing in the coming years? You know how- Oh, I'm so like excited. I'm so excited is that I'm, I'm, I'm 59. I'm going to be doing this for at least another 11 years. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm excited about, you know, we're seeing so much in terms of leadership development 
sales development. I have another book that's going to be released. Uh, it'll be my fourth book that'll be released uh, within the next 12 months. I'm excited about that. And it's just having fun. Why? It comes down to three things. Because I, I'm, I'm passionate about being with the right people. I really pick and choose my clients, the right people, the right questions, and what? The right opportunities. Let's opportunities. stay on that path. Yes, that's, that's where we started. Wow. Paul, it's a pleasure. Uh, this is going to help a lot of people. Thanks, Ashish. Okay. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.